Good morning. Welcome to First United Church of Christ on this August the 8th of 2021. I love that hymn and it certainly sets an appropriate stage for this morning's worship service. Let us read our call to worship responsibly. Hints and whispers about God seeks us where we are. A voice calls our name in the twilight of sleep. A call seen in the outstretched hands of the poor. A new dawning of insight while at prayer. An internal shift of perception that is felt in the heart. A joyous peace in the midst of play. A lifting of a burden. A flood of tears. A bushel of laughter. God is so near, guardian and friend, who speaks to us. It's appropriate for us, before we worship or continue our worship, to confess our sins. And so, let us come together in this holy place and confess our sins before God and before one another. Creative, passionate God, you delight to shape the world in beauty and harmony. You invite us to participate in the balance of creation. We grow in wisdom as our experience unfolds. We take good learning out of difficult situations, yet also find our well-meant endeavors leading to unintended consequences. Too often we give in to temptation that disrupts the joyous and chaotic order of the universe. We cannot undo all our mistakes, but we can turn once more to the living presence of Jesus and to find new ways to live and to love each other and the earth. Do not let our hearts be fearful, but let us in silence acknowledge our sin and seek the forgiveness that restores our peace. Let us pause and forgive, praise, forgive our sins together in silence. Even as Adam and Eve faced the consequences of their sin, our God prepared a way for them still to be connected to the earth and to the living presence of God. And so it is with all of us in Christ's life, ministry, death, and resurrection, we are made able to persist upright and strong, for our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. We'll soon be turning to God's word to illumine our paths, and so let us indeed pray a prayer for illumination. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me an understanding of your law, that I may observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. We read from 2 Samuel, certainly some way on in, in David's uh, kingdom. You have this record. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Atai, Be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of his commanders. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel. And the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There Israel's troops were routed by David's men, and the casualties that day were great, 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men, who was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair, and the mule he was riding kept on going. And ten of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. And as we pick up in the 30th, for the 34th verse, Then the Cushite arrived and said, My lord the king, hear the good news. The lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all those who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite replied, May the, enemy, may the enemies of my Lord and King and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He threw him over the gateway and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Absalom, my son, my son. 
Then we continue to read from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, this time from the fourth chapter, verses 25 through uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. We are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Our reading from, from God, John's Gospel for the morning will, will sound familiar because it's indeed the same reading we had from last week because this is one of particular import and gives us several opportunities uh, to expound on, on this particular Gospel text. This follows up on the feeding of the 5,000. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, how did you get here? He answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which is which the Son of Man will give you. For in him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, What must be what must be do to do the work that God requires? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. As I told you, you have seen me and you do not believe. All those whom the Father gives, gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all, none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus said. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. As it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God, and he has only seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life, and I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so, so the one who feeds on me will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. This he said while teaching in this synagogue at Capernaum. One of my favorite stories is about an old farmer. He always calls, he calls his hogs up for, feet for the treating trough by, by, by hitting a, a piece of wood three times. Tap, tap, tap. And that's all it took, and, and they'll come running. It was a great system until, for some reason, all of a sudden they seemed to, to be losing weight. No matter how much they ate, they, they seemed to be losing weight. And one day, he discovered the culprit. It was a woodpecker sitting on, on, the, on a tree nearby, and every time the woodpecker tap, pecked the tree, tap, 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 the hogs came running. I guess it was all that extra running that uh, helped them lose the weight and stay true. Now, as we read this gospel record from John, that we see that the people of Israel really were no different from, from you and from me. They were, they were constantly looking for signs. and The problem was they had, they had trouble discerning between the sign of the farmer tapping on what his piece of wood and the sign of the woodpecker tapping on the tree. <coughs> And I think it's the same way with all of us. It's the same way with people who, who rely on signs and miracles rather than simply listening to the Word of God. In Matthew, Jesus said, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You know, don't we all do that? We stub our toe on the way to the kitchen in the morning. We man, it's going to be a bad day. The rains on the day of a wedding, we say, and this marriage is going to have problems. No, that, that's just human nature. We, we attach significance to events that really have, have no significance at all. You know, we, we think it's the call of the farmer when it's really only the call of, of the woodpecker. That's why so many of us really feel that the trough of our life is, is, is empty. My mom was, was very proud of her English heritage. She was a little bit chagrined when she found out when... Uh, her niece did some very, very deep research into the right family history that, that she's got some Irish there. And she's got some Scots there, too. And that gives me the right to tell a story about uh, Robert Bruce. Uh, he was the king of Scotland in, in the 14th century. And we know the story of Robert Bruce. Uh, he was routed by the English uh, and confined to, the, to an island off the coast of Ireland. In the past the time, he was stunning a spider who was trying to fix his web to, to a beam on the top of his cell. The spider failed in that attempt six times. <coughs> now, shall the spider, uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce asked, teach me what, what I'm supposed to do? Because I've also failed six times. And it was in that seventh attempt that the spider successfully fixed his web to, to the beam. And Bruce took that as a sign. And he thought it was a significant sign. And he, he gathered together a handful of followers. And he escaped from prison. And he returned to Scotland. And we know that, that after a series of battles, he, uh, he won uh, independence of Scotland in, in 1314. And that's when England finally had declared Scotland to be free of, of any British, British rule. It was all because of a spider. In fact, to this day I'm told if you're in Scotland, if you step on a spider, people think you're doomed to uh, quite a bit of, of bad luck. Now, I think most of us know it would be pretty risky for us to... to plot our future on the, on the ideas of a spider. You know, Robert Bruce could have uh, gone back to Scotland and been defeated just as easily as, as he won. Signs are, are, are notoriously fickle. They're, they're for superstitious people. Signs are, are not for Christians. And yet, we keep making that very same mistake as the people of Israel. And for virtually every other people on the face of the earth, we're looking for signs. It's kind of interesting, particularly again as we read this sixth chapter of John, that Jesus had just performed an extraordinary miracle, feeding 5,000 men, 50 to 20,000 people. You'd think that that would have convinced the people as to who he was. 
that he was the one they were waiting for, but that, that wasn't enough. And I think that's why God really doesn't reveal himself in signs and in wonders. They're, they're never enough. We're always looking for, for one bit of more proof. We, we find a way to, to explain even the most outrageous act. But the very fact that the sun rises every morning, that the gentle we can see the gentle opening of, of a flower in spring, that we can witness the birth of, of a baby, these things ought to be enough evidence for anyone to accept the belief of a creator. But it's not. But we're always asking for more. And now the people of, 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 of Israel wanted one more sign that Jesus was the Messiah. What, what miraculous sign will you give that, that we will see it and believe in you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate, ate bad in the desert, and as it was written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Moses said to them, I tell you the truth. It's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then the response is, Sir, from now on, give us this bread. And Jesus makes a startling declaration. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and who believes in me will never be thirsty. What does it mean? No, I think it means that, that the faith in Christ doesn't depend upon signs and upon miracles. Faith in Christ is, a, is an inner assurance that whatever comes, God is with us. <laughs> the fact is that, that faith in Jesus Christ is rooted in, in God's love. I guess the question we ought to ask this morning is, do, do we know that God loves us? And I think the truth of the matter is that, that we most of us think that God loves us. We're not altogether 100% sure. If something comes along, that one piece of evidence that, that trips the, the scale one way or another, that's where our faith is going to turn. You all remember the, um, the horrible shootings out in Columbine High School in Colorado, Remember the young girl, Cassie Barnell, she was 17 years old. Uh, the Rocky Mountain News wrote this. People around the world know that Cassie, as the Columbine student who died confessing her faith. Her killer asked her if she believed in God. She told him she did, and then he shot her at 17. Ask yourself, if you were Cassie's family, could, could you handle that and, and still believe that, that God is a loving God? Think about Arthur Ashe. We spoke about him just a, a couple of weeks ago, the, the late great you know, tennis champion. He acquired AIDS, as we all know, through a blood transfusion uh, when he went under, underwent heart surgery. The people in the hospital didn't suspect that that, that blood was tainted. Ashe certainly didn't believe that or know that blood was tainted. We didn't even think about AIDS being uh, transmitted through, through blood transfusions. Ash didn't even know that he was infected until five years later when he went for, for, uh, for further surgery. He was experiencing some, some numbness, numbness in his hand, and they uh, found a malignant brain tumor and traced that back to, to AIDS. There he was, the seventh-ranked tennis player in the world. And what did he have to do? He had to face you know, the most horrendous, small-minded, bigoted, asinine rumors about his condition. He had to deal with his retirement from his beloved sport, and he had to deal with his death. It could be easy for him to be angry at God. Who could have blamed him? But here he is in, in 1992, when he's addressing the students at the Niagara Community College in New York, and he testified that despite having this disease, his trust in God was firm. Ash knew that regardless of the outcome, God would remain with him throughout his ordeal. That's an amazing testimony of faith. I sometimes ask, could, could I do that? Is my faith that strong? Because you think, I think for most of us, we're kind of insecure about God's love. And if things are going our way and, and the kids are healthy and the house payment's been made and we got some money in the bank and the job's okay, you know, then God's with us. But let something go to knock that askew and all of a sudden we're, we're not quite so sure that, that God loves us. We'll start looking for a sign. 
Has it all been a mistake? Is it all futile? Is God really with me? I think one of the most dramatic characters coming out of, of World War II was a woman named Carrie Tenbu. I think you know her story. We've spoken about it before. She, she was uh, arrested in Holland for sheltering uh, Jews from the Nazis, and she was transported to a death camp in Germany. She was subject to all kinds of humiliation and torture. She watched her sister die there. And yet, Carrie, Carrie Ten Boom would later write, How, however deep the pit, God's love is deeper still. Christian love is rooted in God's love. You know, the, the Old Testament uh, character Job, Job, we've all written about him, read about him and read the play JB. He experienced all manner of grievous misfortunes. He, he lost his health, he lost his children, he lost his great his family. And yet he was able to cry out through, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Later he, he says, uh, Oh, that my words were recorded. That they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I, and not another. That, one of the dramatic testimonies of faith in, in, in all of Scripture. Not dependent upon any kind of age. External circumstances, but an internal assurance that, that Job had. Christian faith is truly rooted in God's love. Other thing I, I think we know is that, that we, we live in, in a, a Christian faith which is also rooted in, in God's law. It's inescapable that we live in, in, in a lawful universe. You drop a book and it falls to the ground. Uh, why? Because of, of the law of gravity. Thelma and Louise drive a car off a cliff and, and they smash into the canyon floor below. Why? Because we, we live in a lawful universe. Now, could a divine hand reach out and grab that car? Sure. It could happen, I suppose, but I think anything is possible with God, but it's not likely that that's what's going to happen. We live in a lawful universe. And it is the most magnificent universe you can imagine. I think most of us remember the name of Laura Engels Wilder. She was the, the author of the Little House on the Prairie series, and she put it this way. What a beautiful world this is. Have you noticed the wonderful coloring of the sky at sunrise? For me, there is no time like the early morning when the spirit of light broods over the earth as it is awakening. What glorious colors in the woods these days. Did you ever think that great painters have spent their lives trying to re reproduce on campus? canvas what we see every day. Thousands of dollars are paid for canvases that are not nearly so beautiful as those available to us every single morning. The colors in the sky at sunset, the delicate tints of the, of the early spring foliage, the, the, the beautiful autumn leaves, the, the soft colored grasses, the, the lovely flowers. No painter will ever be able to equal their beauty with paint and brush. I think we have to understand that creation works the way it does because God structured it to obey certain laws. That's why we can expect the sun to rise tomorrow morning, just at the time it's supposed to. But if it didn't, every single molecule in the, in the universe would be affected. You know, we're simply foolish when we expect God to, to uh, suspend any of his laws for, for a moment. The life on this earth depends upon those laws. Intellectually, I think we all really understand that, and yet we still pray, please, Lord, don't let it rain on my daughter's wedding. Wouldn't it be, be, be better off praying, please, Lord, regardless of the weather, help me have a, have a positive attitude about, about the, this so I can radiate the kind of cheerfulness that, that will make this great date for every, great for everyone I see? Christian faith is rooted in God's love. It's rooted in God's law. And that includes God's moral law. You know, I, I think uh, Robin Williams one time described us as the people who love to sow our wild seeds and then pray for a crop failure. Yeah. I think we all know from bitter experience that ain't the way the earth works. God is a God of grace and forgiveness, but, but there are laws that govern human behavior, just as, as there are laws that, that govern the rising and setting of the sun. 
And when we run afoul of those laws, not only do we suffer, but other people suffer. We can be forgiven. You're still admitted to paradise on that last day, but that doesn't change the fact that sin brings suffering. Christian faith is rooted in God's law and in God's love. But I think most importantly, Christian faith is rooted in, in God's revelation. You know, Christian faith isn't just a, a, a philosophy. It's not just a, a way to live your life. But no one sat down and just, just made this stuff up. Christian faith is rooted in, in God's revelation. When we couldn't reach up to God, God reached down to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what distinguishes the Christian faith from virtually every other religion and philosophy of life. Only one thing, the person of, of Jesus Christ. We believe that he is indeed the bread that came down from heaven. The Hebrew Bible, which we as Christians call the Old Testament, uh, the Bible we share with our Jewish friends. We even share that Bible in many respects with our Muslim friends. Muslims accept Jesus as a prophet. What makes us unique is that we boldly claim that in Jesus Christ, we get the definitive picture of God. That's what God is like. That's what we explain. God is like Jesus. Jesus is God in human flesh. It's an extraordinary claim, but we stake our lives upon it. So it's not good enough for us to go back and look at the Old Testament. And, and, and even as, as our friend, Muslim, Muslim friends might say after the Islam, for that idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth that I hear people say all the time. That's the Old Testament. It's not the New. Now we as Christians have to cite the words of, of our Lord in the Sermon of the Mount. It's inconvenient for us sometimes, but it's remarkably true. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it is said, love your enemy, love your neighbor, and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. That is what separates Christians. That's what sets us apart. You know, I think we, we all forget it at times, and I'm as guilty as anybody. But that is our faith. We believe in Jesus. We believe that he is the Son of God. We believe that what he says is true. He is the bread that came down from heaven to feed our souls. We ask no more than, than to live for him. Christian faith is rooted in God's love. It's rooted in God's law. It's rooted in God's revelation in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's be sure that we're not distracted by the, the sound of the woodpecker. We as Christians don't, don't need a sign. We are fed directly from God's hand. Amen. As Christians, with this unique sense of God and the person of Jesus Christ, let us confess our faith. We're not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who, is, who has created and is creating, who has come to us in Jesus, the Word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus' message of hope, inclusion, and grace. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. As we prepare ourselves for, for prayer, let us keep these members of our household of faith and our larger household of faith in our minds this week. We think about newborn Arthur and David Freitag and Tom Bauer and Tom Boger and Nancy Krause and Kathleen Dowd and Naomi Protniak and Phyllis Rush and Helena Rapp and 
Alina, Helen Lissenberger, and, and Marge Harron, and, and Margaret's sister as well. Let's keep all of them in our prayers this week. Let us pray. As we enter this time of prayer, O oh God, we offer our gratitude that you are always present to us. Instill in us a desire to so listen to others. Help us to listen with open hearts and open minds that others may feel safe in our presence. Instill in us a spirit of serenity that others might feel accepted in your non-judgmental grace. Free us from the tendency to label people and ideas and allow us instead to lean into mercy and kindness. In the stillness of these moments, we acknowledge the times we've been less than kind, merciful and open. Thank you for never banning us from your presence, loving God. Help us to so love and accept others. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May we pray a prayer, a prayer of dedication, dedicating our, our souls and our minds and our lives and our work. We bring our gifts with gratitude for the opportunity to give. We thank you, O Lord, for the bounty that is ours and for the freedom we have to worship as we choose. We are grateful for the ready, endless choices that are ours to ponder and partake. We bring our gifts with hearts full of thanksgiving for all that is ours. We ask only that you would help us to remember. Amen. We pause and begin with our benediction, followed immediately by our final hymn of worship. For our benediction, go now and be fruitful followers of God. Speak words of kindness and live lives of peace. Serve faithfully and fill all your days and may God's amazing love be your guide forever. Amen. Let's prepare ourselves for the final hymn of worship. Amen. Good night.